All right, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. It's a great uh, chance to uh, come to see every year the new innovation that's uh, happening in deep tech. Uh, that's a topic that's really uh, close to our heart because we invest uh, in hardware and we invest in life sciences and uh, Hello Tomorrow has a lot of both. Um, so today my presentation is about disruption with hardware. And I'd like to talk about different aspects of innovation, the crazy aspect, the cool aspect, and the boring aspect of innovation. Uh, generally, when we think of innovation and disruption, we hear that word a lot, and it's almost like this. Like, disruption is coming, the robots are taking our jobs, uh, basically everything is going to fall apart. There's a lot of uh, negative news about innovation. And uh, in a way, everyone is expecting something very spectacular to happen, um, to have another little Tintin quote there here, um, almost something like a, lo um, a solar eclipse. And then there's the panic that ensues, right? Um, so what I want to share is that actually disruption that's actually happening is tend to be actually quite quiet. Uh, we've done a lot of investments in hardware, and most of them actually don't make big news. Um, I'll try to explain a bit of what's happening through some examples. So I'll go back a few years ago in, in Silicon Valley in 2011. Um, a company very famous in robotics called Willow Garage, maybe some of you know, uh, they invented the operating system that pretty much everyone's using for robots. Um, so this company had a very advanced uh, research robot and they decided to give it a new task, to challenge it. And they decided to address this problem very well-known problem of dog poop that has been you know, addressed in, in France over the past few years. And so they got their robot uh, to work on that. So here's the robot. I don't know if we can get the sound to the video there. But uh, essentially, robot is going with a scoop, scooping the, the target and putting it in a bucket. And you can see it's like, you know, very you know, efficient way of doing it, but it's not uh, necessarily the most cost efficient. So this robot actually cost $400,000. Also, it complained after. It wasn't very happy about it. Um, so that's a, a, a bit of a problem if you try to, to solve a problem at scale that the solution is so expensive. So before I go into more details about how this problem can be solved today, the obvious ones are, first, developing such technology takes a lot of time the costs are very high, then the end price of the product is also very high, which puts it basically out of reach of most consumers. And the vision, in a way, the understanding of how to solve the problem is a little bit too literal. In a way, the robot is solving the, sa the problem in the same way that the human being would do it. We're trying to replicate the human approach to the problem. Whereas the future is a mix of things where you have this type of crazy technologies, but also things that are actually more efficient and cost particularly cost-effective. So quickly about me, so my name is Benjamin. I'm one of the partners at Hacks. We're an investment company focused on hardware. We're part of a larger group called SOSV. SOSV is one of the big four uh, investors at early stage alongside Y Combinator, Techstars, and 500 startups. We invest in over 150 companies a year, about a third in hardware. We invest in hardware, life sciences, and a few other things. Um, over the past five years, we invest in over 200 companies uh, that, who raised close to half a billion dollars. A um, number of them are in consumer space. They run over 100 Kickstarters. They raise over $50 million from backers in aggregate. Um, and the reason we focus on hardware is really because we think hardware has the chance to address problems in the physical world the way software can't. Uh, software is eating the world, but it's kind of lacking teeth. Uh, so hardware brings that uh, for the physical world and the human body for, through health tech. So the upside of the job uh, is that we really get to touch physically the future because we see very early stage companies at the prototyping stage. The downside is that there's a long wait uh, because they need to get to market and they need to get to scale. Typically, the companies we work with are not going to be at large scale until three, four, five years. So we really get to see that, that future happening. Um, you're probably familiar with those curves, the S curve for the adoption curve of technology and uh, you know, crossing the gap, uh, the chasm with innovators, early adopters and all those things. So what you see here is that over time, which is the X axis, well, at the beginning, not many people have access to the technology and then suddenly everyone has it and then it tapers off. So this is typically, I'd say for most technologies, about a 10 years time frame. 
Uh, what that also means is that if you're an incumbent company, a very large company, uh, let's say at a you know, $100 million or whatever business size you have, well, at first you have a startup, the, the first two years they do R&D, then they start to have you know, a little business, million, one million, two million, and then they, if they double every year, after 10 years they overtake you, and by the time you start to notice them, when they're like a quarter of your size, they're just one or two years away of passing you. So, you know, that's essentially what's happening with, uh, with startups and the reason why it's very hard to notice them initially. Um, if we think about hardware, you're probably very familiar with those products. Uh, you could call the first wave of consumer hardware, uh, Fitbit, GoPro, DJI drones, 3D printing, those were like the first wave. Interestingly, actually, all those companies are about 10 years old. And today, you know, those are very mature products. Some of them are commoditized. And, tip, and quite clearly, they're not the next wave. They're the old wave. So what's next? What's next? Uh, we can turn to science fiction. Turns out it's mostly wrong. Sometimes there's a lucky guess. Um, so if we look at science fiction, what everybody expects, uh, the visions of the future, we already have them. We have the flying car. This is a product from Slo Slovakia. Still pretty expensive, but it works. Uh, this is a you know fairly risky jetpack type of thing. Also works. Also exists. Uh, this is a picture I took in uh, Tokyo in Haneda Airport. Uh, so that's basically a robot assistant. Everybody familiar with it? Uh, it actually felt kind of lonely in its corner <laughs> and not very uh, you know useful. Uh, and I think this is because it's a legacy of the old vision of science fiction. Uh, you know, this is basically since Metropolis and Fritz Lang, like that's a hundred years old vision. Um, so the problem is that they're impractical, they're expensive, and the real future is really different. Uh, I'd like to apply something I call the grandchild test. That imagine you live in the future, and your grandchildren, and you talk to them, and you tell about your life during the present day, and they tell you, oh, how could you do that? That was so, you know, impractical, uh, all inconvenient. So this is what tells you that Something has happened, something has changed, some disruption has happened. Um, if I look back on my, my childhood, I remember waiting for calls or calling you know, my girlfriend's family home and getting the, her dad on the phone, and that was looked so inconvenient and impractical, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty happy things have changed. Um, but that was the, you know, the way we we're doing things at the time. Uh, I'll take a few examples. Um, you're all familiar with headphones, and if you look at them, they look pretty much all the same. They have you know, some of them have uh, uh, noise cancelling or a little bit better design, but essentially they do more or less the same thing. Um, but as it turns out, we all have different ear shapes, and we also have different sensitivity to sound, low tones, mid tones, high tones. So if you think of glasses, this is actually not a surprise that we, we're all familiar with the idea that we all have different eyesights, but how about our hearing? Doesn't, does it make sense to all have the same type of sound coming out of headphones? with the same shape. We have designer glasses, why not designer headphones? Not be beyond the look, but actually adapting to your senses. So here are two products actually doing that. Uh, one called Revels, uh, they do custom fit in one minute. So they have a little silicone in sleeve inside which there's some gel, and by pressing a button on your smartphone after placing it into your ear, it actually shapes to your unique shape in one minute. So it's cust instant custom fit. Here's another product that is uh, just uh, launching at the moment called Neura. It tunes to your hearing. It sends initially a little calibration signal to your ear, and in, within about 30 seconds, get the signal back, analyzes it, and creates a personal equalizer. So when you think of glasses, it makes lots of sense to have something similar adapting to every single one of our senses, and that's pretty much the way it should be for the future. The impression you get after trying headphones like this is like taking your head out of the water. But there's more. Now, you could also put some new sensors into the devices. This is another product called Mindset um, that uh, has brainwave sensors embedded into the, um, the headphones. And they help you keep focus. They um, basically track your whether you're distracted or not, and they can signal you how to get back into the zone. I'll take some examples also in the sleep category. Uh, all those products, by the way, are from our portfolio because uh, uh, I know them best and I think they're, they're particularly interesting. Uh, here's one. So sleep, we all know about sleep. We all know about maybe bad sleep and insomnia. Today, the main solution is 
maybe sleeping pills. And if you don't like medication, well, sometimes you have other ways to cope, but they don't necessarily help. Um, uh, you can track your sleep, but tracking your sleep doesn't really help you solve it because it doesn't really do anything. So the idea is really that we're going from tracking to solving problems. Uh, to give some examples, oh, well, that's another way to solve it, yoga for insomnia, not for everybody. Um, but if you just think about technology, today we don't have a lot of solutions, so mostly you just wait. So I'll present some, some solutions, uh, one called Muna, actually a startup from France. They have basically a thermostat for your pillow. Um, they just wrapped up a Kickstarter campaign, and what's interesting about them is that, yes, it controls temperature, it tracks your movement to correlate both, but the most interesting is that it's really all about the data, all about learning about how you sleep and how you respond to temperature and the different conditions in your sleeping environment. And you will see that's kind of a thread. This is another product uh, that combines light, sounds, and heart rate variability measurement to basically measure how, how and help you fall asleep. Uh, and again, there's machine learning there. So, what's, uh, so th another problem you might have with sleeping is maybe sleeping with uh, people who are kind of noisy next to you. Um, and this is a product that targets uh, that category of, of users, as well as business travelers who uh, want, to, want to have a quiet environment. Uh, those are smart headphones to help you sleep. They also have brainwave sensors, but the other challenge they solve is comfort, so that you can keep them while you sleep. And again, machine learning. So if you hear about AI, machine learning is actually now spreading through almost everything. And we're really entering a new phase of products where it's not just about tracking, it's really about finding digital solutions, digital therapies that would compete with, in some cases, pharmaceutical companies on, on variety of drugs. So the key to that is that it's, it's all centered around data. Data is the new blood. And uh, kind, of, kind of strange thing to quote my colleague, but I, th I thought he said something particularly insightful that day, that donating your data in the future might help more than donating an organ. And we're heading step by step toward this new phase of medicine uh, that's called P4 medicine for preventive, predictive, personalized, and participatory, where your contribution of data is helping improve the therapies for everybody. And maybe your grandchild in the future will say, what, you went to hospitals? What a waste of time, what inefficient system. Because you will have a lot of things that will be small devices that will help you solve your health problems at homes and prevent them. Uh, I'll use some other examples because we talk a lot about robots um, and we invest a lot in robots. Um, I'd like to highlight first that automation is not new. Um, you have a lot of machines that have been created to solve dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks. Uh, to mention a few, automation through these type of things, ATMs, washing machines, arguably robots. Um, they definitely replace some jobs, but considering there's a lot of work to do uh, in the world, uh, you can see that uh, they're still badly needed. Uh, your grandchildren might wonder, oh, you were doing this by hand, why not let a machine do it? So boring, so uninteresting task. Um, so jobs change, but there's a lot of work. Um, so let's start with a dull example. Here's a company that is basically doing cleaning. It's like a giant Roomba, a lot smarter, because you know, it cannot just bump into people. Um, this one is de uh, uh, deployed in a Singapore airport, Changi. And I think the most remarkable here on this video is that nobody cares. People go around and they don't seem interested at all in the robot. The robot just does its thing. I'll show another example of another robot that also doesn't try to interact with people. Uh, it's a robot that does automated inventory in supermarkets. It uses computer vision to scan the shelves and it can recognize all the brands, all the products, and tell if they're misplaced, mispriced, or anything like that. This robot can do in 30 minutes a task that usually takes 30 hours. How about dirty jobs? So remember, this guy didn't want to do the job, decided to quit. So we invested in another company uh, that would solve the problem in a different way. So in 2011, Willow Garage had a general purpose robot with onboard computing, very expensive. 2017, it's a specialized robot with cloud computing uh, that cuts the cost dramatically. So here's the robot. It's called Beetle. Looks a little bit like a lawnmower, 
But it has computer vision, cloud computing, and it can actually solve the problem for only $400 instead of $400,000. So the price of solving that task with a robot has been divided by 1,000 in six years. Dangerous tasks, uh, there's plenty of them. Here's one. Uh, how about uh, you know the Spider-Man climbing the buildings to clean them? Uh, here's a robot that can do it. Uh, there's a lot of windows to clean, and it's a lot safer way. And most remarkably, nobody cares about those robots. But they're excellent uh, business examples and business cases. Uh, I'll go into another industry that not often talked about, agriculture. Um, you probably heard of uh, things like using crop sensors. So that's an example. Um, you might have heard of Plenty, who raised a lot of money for vertical farming. Sadly, not a hacks company, but uh, maybe we'll have another one like that. Uh, and recently, this um, tractor company is actually a ro robot that's here to eliminate um, um, weed uh, in a, for lettuce uh, farming. And that company got acquired for over $300 million recently. So essentially, uh, what's happening is that the future is happening, and the question is, how can we make it happen faster? I'll share a story of another French company, actually the founder is based in Silicon Valley, but they are both of them French, and uh, it's a really interesting example, because the product is actually quite simple. It's a kid's watch. Uh, the difference is that it doesn't have all the features that kid's watches usually have. Like, they don't have GPS, they don't have messaging, communication. What they have is icon-based, basically, reminders uh, for all the tasks that the children have to do, like brushing their teeth. What's really interesting is how quickly they went from concept to market. They started with the concept, came to our program in Shenzhen, worked with us for about four months. Then they run a Kickstarter, they raised close to $800,000. And then within 18 months, they, they were actually shipping to their backers, to Target in the US, and to SoftBank in Japan. What's remarkable is that this company took full advantage of the idea that as a company, you have to find the best resources possible wherever they are. For R&D, for prototyping, for production, investment, and sales. And in their case, this is how it maps out. R&D started in US, and now the development team is in France. Prototyping they did in China, in Shenzhen, because things go a lot faster there, a lot cheaper. Production, China and Mexico. Mexico initially for nearshoring to be able to, mat uh, to match the deadlines of the, um, of, uh, the co US customers. And then uh, investment took from US and France. And the sales, as you can see, is global through crowdfunding and then through retail. So in a sense, if you're building a hardware company today, you've got to get a lot of stamps in your passport. So as a conclusion, uh, two ideas to walk away with is that startups, uh, particularly hardware, are getting more global than ever. And you have to think of ecosystems as resources and try to tap into as many relevant ones as you can. And the second, that the new normal is not necessarily going to be spectacular, but it's going to be better. And as we adjust our expectations, we will keep wanting more from the future. So. I like probably, you probably all know the quote, uh, you shouldn't give a man a fish, but teach them how to fish. I think we also need to give them a fishing rod to get started. Thank you very much.